The Pace of Modern Life versus Our Cave Woman Biochemistry. Hey, it's Heather Chauvin, wife, mother of three boys, former social worker, breadwinner, recovering hustler, and stage four cancer survivor. I'm not a fan of that term, by the way. Beyond all of these titles and labels, I'm a human being, just like you, attempting to navigate it all while feeling good. My goal on this podcast is to show you that you can live an energized, sustainable life, both at home and in your work. It doesn't matter if you stay at home full time, if you work from home, you're a CEO, a a successful business owner, or trying to find some inspiration. On this show, I attempt to keep it real with stories, interviews, and random thoughts. This is not a business or career podcast, and it's not a parenting podcast. It's both and so much more. You will laugh. You may even cry. And you may even get a little frustrated with the truth you've been hiding from yourself. I believe all human behavior is a language, whether it's through your child's behavior, your health, or a relationship. And when we learn to listen instead of react, we begin to understand what it truly means to feel alive and in control. It's time to put your big girl pants on and find your brave. Let's go. All right, I am back, ladies, and today I am talking to Dr. Libby. Libby Weaver is an Australian author, speaker, and nutritional biochemist. She is born in South Wales. She has authored the best-selling books, Accidentally Overweight and the Rushing Woman Syndrome. She's also a TEDx speaker on the topic of the pace of the modern life versus cave woman biochemistry. So, um, I don't know. I actually think it was a client of mine who introduced me to the work of Dr. Libby a few years ago. And it was actually that her book, um, the rushing woman syndrome, but rushing woman syndrome is actually a very, uh, I don't want to say dated or older book, but she's written many books since then books, accidentally overweight, exhausted to energize real food, chef real food kitchen, um, sweet food story, the beauty guide, the calorie fallacy, the energy guide, the invisible, uh, load. What am I supposed to eat? Women's wellness wisdom. So Dr. Libby is just a wealth of knowledge in the women's health world. And I wanted to have a conversation with her because when I read her book, uh, the rushing women's syndrome or rushing women's syndrome, there, she actually has a kind of test inside of this guide and you have to kind of self rate yourself one to four, four being like you're high as in you are a rushing woman. Um, and the closer you are to one. So a lot of them are people pleasing tendencies or just the reaction of uh, misaligned biochemistry. So what do I mean by that? It is your emotional load, so meaning anxiety, depression, uh, your sleep quality, but also emotion, um, I don't want to say emotional, what would you call that? Kind of like your people-pleasing tendencies, like the mind as well. And the reason why I love Dr. Libby's work so much is because, and I've talked about this on the podcast previously, but if you've been following me you know that part of my story is my health journey. And the more I dig into hormones, um, and I am not someone, I actually have gone through menopause uh, when I was in chemo, but since then, actually it's a whole other, that's a whole other podcast. Um, I'm not even perimetopausal. So the hormone journey as a woman in a nutshell is, not well mainstream yet. Meaning when you typically go to the doctor's office and you say something is off, it could be your emotional health, your physical health, mental health. Um, you know, you could be crying, you could be screaming, you could be fatigued, chronically fatigued. And oftentimes we're receiving feedback and support that is not in alignment with the real issue. And I'm just going to be really honest that 
you need to become your own advocate. And whether you are listening to this information for the first time, you're like, oh my gosh, this is groundbreaking work. I want you to know that even on my own personal development journey, I, and my own health journey, I have this mindset and I've definitely developed this mindset that we need to become our own health advocate. And every healthcare professional, including myself, that you come into contact with, you take what they say, you implement, but you also can co-create with that healthcare professional. And if that healthcare professional is on an ego trip and they're like, do it my way or the highway, they're probably not a right fit for you. Because there are many times where I have asked, why are we implementing this? Why are we doing that? Or, you know, here, I'm curious, but this is what has worked for me. What do you think about that? True, authentic healing, whether it's your physical body, your mental body, helps with a co-creation. That you feel like you are owning your power and you are utilizing that healthcare, that healthcare professional for their wisdom and their guidance on a topic that you are not an expert in. And so you educate yourself. You become your own learner, right? There is a little bit of self-directed learning that's needed. You are the only one that is going to implement, the one that takes action. But if something is not working and you're like, I'm doing the same thing over and over and over again and nothing is changing, that is a sign that you need to seek different support. So I'm a huge fan of It Takes a Village. What I mean by that is we need to co-create and collaborate with healthcare professionals, not just in one genre. Your MD, your medical professionals are geniuses in one area. Your mental health professionals are geniuses in one area. Your functional medicine doctors are geniuses in one area. Emotional health, spiritual health. And when you take, bring it all together, that is where the magic happens. So I'm really excited for you to dive into Dr. Libby's um, interview today. You can check her out at Dr. Libby, L-I-B-B-Y dot com. Go to her website, check out all of her books, invest in her wisdom. She's been doing this for many, many years, and I want to hear about what you think of this conversation. So head on over to Instagram, find me at Heather Chauvin underscore. My last name is spelled C-H-A-U-V-I-N dot com underscore, or not dot com. It's Heather. Oh my God. My son is trying to get in the car and it's distracting me at Heather Chauvin underscore. Find me on Instagram and uh, send me a private message. I want to know what did you think of this conversation? Was it an aha moment for you? Did it give you the little puzzle piece that you needed to take back control of your health? All right, Dr. Libby, welcome to the Mom is in Control podcast. Heather, thank you so much for having me join you. We reached out to you because it was actually a client of mine who referred me to your book, which I know is not your newest book, um, your book called Rushing Women's Syndrome, The Impact of a Never-Ending To-Do List and How to Stay Healthy in Today's Busy World. When did you, um, when did you publish this book? So I wrote that book in, I published it in 2011. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, about nine years old, but wow. uh, it's still just as relevant today, I think, probably even more so uh, given uh, the, the, the life that so many women are leading with. The way I kind of see it really is this, um, it's almost like a frantic double shift of work day and night. And that's very new to our body and also to our psychology. So I wanted to write a book about what I was observing was going on in women's health. Yeah, and I'm so excited to dive into that today. And I know you've written other books as well. Um, but obviously, we're, we're recording this during a pandemic, right? During COVID, all of this, um, a lot is happening in the world right now. And what I'm hearing from women is, you know, whatever, if I was the rushing woman before, now it's just 10x and I can no longer look away from this issue. I have to I have to start somewhere. So what do you say, first of all, why did you get into writing a book like this? What led you to this? 
Yeah, so I so I went to university for 14 years, which I know makes me sound really thick, but I loved learning. So I did nutrition and dietetics first, and then I did a PhD in biochemistry. And then after university, I started seeing patients one-on-one. So essentially looking at women's health, their hormones, their nutrition. And uh, I've done that now for just over 20 years. And about around 2009, 2010, I noticed a dramatic difference in what I was seeing in my female patients. And, uh, And I wanted to delve into that. So prior to that, People used to turn up to appointments and they would come across as relatively calm. They might have had stresses in their life, of course, but there was a a level of calm that started to disappear around about 2010. And the way it was translating into what my patients were experiencing were really, really real challenges with their reproductive system, with their nervous system that was then translating to problems with their digestion. So a lot of irritable bowel syndrome, a lot of sleep challenges, and that, all of that, of course, then has an enormous effect on our quality of life and our relationships, our self-perceptions. So I really, I wrote the book uh, to dive into the science of it all and to help women understand what was actually going on in their bodies and to then start to give them some practical ideas about ways they could transition out of this feeling like there just aren't enough hours in the day. What do you think, I mean, there's what we see on a surface level, right, as a societal Uh, what I call like acceptance, like this normality of, you know, we're just busy. Everyone's overwhelmed. And of course, we're talking on like a hormone level of what's happening inside of our bodies. And, you know, how do you answer that question maybe around how the traditional model is failing women, like the traditional health model? Because typically people the first thing, and I had this, my own experience is going to the doctor and saying something's up and it's like, here's a pill, here's something to do. Like, what do you say to that woman? That's like, I don't know what else to do. Like, where do I begin? This feels like a very overwhelming process. Mm. It's, it's picking, it's finding where the suffering is greatest and then diving in there so that that can start to be alleviated. So for example, if the person's menstrual cycle, if their period is really, really challenging for them every month, they might need time off work, or it might have a really big impact on some of their most important relationships, for example, uh, or the way they're able to handle stress or sleep, then we dive in there and we start to pull that apart and go, okay, what's happening here? Is it too much estrogen? Is it not enough progesterone? And then we start to correct that because once you start to help someone feel even just a little bit better it gives them hope that they're not always going to feel so lousy and then other things also then start to shift so I always would just pick one thing and start there and usually something I knew was going to help them to uh, feel somewhat better so that um, yeah they were really open to making more changes. Do you find um, this is what I've experienced in my own health journey it's like I don't want to say you start going down a rabbit hole. You start to see growth and the shift, right? Especially if you are looking like for me, my big wake up call was cancer. And then after that, you know, I went in through met into menopause because I had chemo and I came out of that. And I just looked at my doctor and said, like, you should never, you should tell people what is going to happen to them mentally. I, you know, I've, I've meditated or journaled, like I have some type of, Uh, what am I trying to say? Some type of self-awareness strategies previous to getting sick. Um, I would never recommend that on anyone as to what I went through from a hormone perspective, jumping back out of that. So oftentimes women are told they're crazy. There's something wrong with them. And then they're starting this journey. They're feeling a little re-energized. Their periods aren't hurting so much. And yet there's this like not enoughness of like, oh, well, now I got to do this. Now I got to do this. Like, can you speak to any of that? I'm almost wanting to be like, you know, when women say, um, I'm trying to find balance and there's, is there such thing as like perfectly balanced hormones? Like when can we stop or do we, is this something we always have to be working on? I, uh, I think balance, so hormone, hormonal balance is attainable. Absolutely. Uh, But I do think it's something that we have to always be aware of. And for some women, their lifestyle choices 
are very health supporting and they just are what they are and it's almost not even a conscious effort it's just how they live whereas for other women it's not their natural way of existing and it is a constant uh they ha they have to apply a constant awareness to oh i'm not going to make that choice today i'll make this one instead because that might affect my liver which is going to affect my estrogen metabolism and it's really important to me that i look after that so rather than it being i think a lot of women have come out of an era with a real dieting mentality and what i mean by that is you know trying to look after body shape and size as the primary focus and often that was achieved by not eating enough and exercising like a maniac and quite often the results don't don't come and women feel like their bodies betray them uh, mm -hmm. in, in so many different ways so we, we've come out the back of that kind of cultural thinking, but I think there's a big, uh, I think a lot of women still feel like that, that's in the back of their mind. And a big part of my work is to help them shift to focus on their health. So when it might be whatever it is, hormones, sleep, whatever it is that they are feeling, uh, that their body's communicating to them, it needs attention. And once you go, as you called it, once you go down that rabbit hole and you start to learn, oh my goodness, I now understand that these five lifestyle choices are making the biggest impact on my sex hormones and them being out of balance, it's just I, that is going to be effortless for me. I am doing that. So rather than it coming from deprivation, I'm not allowed to do that. It comes from I care about myself. I value myself and my health and energy so much. My decisions are coming from a place of, of a deep care for myself. So therefore, it's, it's almost effortless to make that choice. I also think that we inst to talk to that point about our bodies betraying us. I think a lot of women feel like that, not just with their body shape and size at times, but um, with things like hormones. And the way I approach it is our body really can be our best friend. It doesn't have a voice, but it gives us symptoms to let us know when there's something awry. And it's, it's giving us those symptoms to give us feedback about our choices in the way that we eat, drink, move, think, breathe, believe, or perceive. So it's pointing us to examine one or many of those areas. And once you go down that rabbit hole, my experience in my own life and in witnessing what's occurred in, other, in, in my patients is it's, it fosters an enormous shift, way bigger than you could ever imagine. So you don't only just get health improvements with your physical body, but it shifts the way you see things. It shifts the way you see yourself and the way you value yourself. And you start to remember what you were born knowing, which is that you are enough. Mm, I think that's the core of all of this, right? Like I am yep. enough. And when you begin to believe that you treat your body differently and then you treat your life and people differently and take different, um, different actions. I know a big part um, you know, talking about a never ending to do list. So, okay, let's, let's kind of dissect this. Maybe if there's like a cycle that's happening. So the, the kind of tagline for this book, the rushing women syndrome, which is, you know, said almost a decade old and there's been like one, two, three, four, five books you've written since then more than that, maybe. Um, the impact of a never ending to do list. So a never ending to do list is something external. Can you describe what's happening there? Why do women feel like they have a never ending to-do list? And how are those thoughts affecting our emotions, affecting our body, affecting our hormones, affecting our health? But can you explain that process? Yeah, absolutely. So it's essentially down to a couple, a couple of things. Firstly, it's our perception. So there are some people that have a to-do list that's never ending and it's never all crossed off and they don't mind. They're not bothered by that. Whereas for others, it really bothers them that not everything is done or they'll say there just aren't enough hours in the day for me to get everything done that I need to. And it's the, there's three pillars to my work, the biochemical, the nutritional and the emotional. And in the emotional pillar and that third pillar is where I offer up the idea that it's our beliefs that drive our behaviour. And so when we believe there aren't enough hours in the day, that will be our experience. Where at, and and you'll, we'll run around with intensity, there aren't enough hours in the day and we'll just feel like we can't get enough done. Whereas if you have a belief that all the important things always get done, or if you have a belief that the things I prioritise, the things that I value always get attended to, there's a level of calm that instantly arises because 
you're okay with whatever it is you're going to get done that day. Now, that doesn't change how much you might need to do in a day. It might not change that your day is very full and it is very busy, but there's a really big difference between having a busy full day that's fulfilling at times, challenging at times. That's a very different experience to I never get enough done because that touches the not enoughness constantly. So it's really important when we, when our never ending to-do list really bothers us, it's very important to check in with ourselves and see if there's a belief there that was set up when we were younger, often uh, if, if hard work, a good work ethic was uh, admired or if we modelled ourselves on people who had a good work ethic, that's beautiful and there are many gifts in that. But we also need to be able to be the other way. We need to be able to not be valued just for our work ethic and our efficiency and for being a hard worker. So to help people identify that, I came up with this idea called forward words. And our forward words are the way we need other people to see us, the traits we need other people to see in us. So I think a really great exercise for people to do is to take pen and paper and ask yourself the question, how do I need other people to see me? And, some of the, and, and write freely. So some of the words that commonly come out, I need people to see me as kind, thoughtful, selfless, efficient, hardworking, intelligent, independent, thorough, uh, caring, funny, hilarious, Perfect is a common one, the best, the favourite, the most special or the biggest ray of sunshine that ever walked into a room. And so then once you can identify how you need other people to see you, the next time you feel really stressed on the inside about not getting enough done or whatever it is that, that works you up on the inside, pause and consider, am I perceiving that someone might be seeing me in a way that is the opposite to one of my forward words? So in other words, am I perceiving that someone thinks I'm lazy or someone thinks I'm inefficient or someone thinks I'm not a hard worker or that I'm selfish? And nearly always you'll see that that's a story you're creating. I'm worried that a colleague thinks that or my daughter thinks that or my husband thinks that or whatever it is. We we worry that someone's seeing us in a way that we can't bear to be seen. And when, we, when you dig into, I guess, what creates all of that in us, it makes a lot of sense because as little humans, we, someone has to, we, we can't survive on our own when we're first born the way other animals can. Someone has to care enough about us to, and to give us food and clothing and shelter so that we can literally survive. And in our nervous system, we come to work out that there are certain behaviours that gain us favour. And I don't mean that in a manipulative, constructed way, It's just how we operate to ensure our survival. So we take on these traits and there's a lot of beauty in them. You know, if you're a kind person and that's something that's important to you, you will have beautiful relationships and friendships. People will value you. They'll probably confide in you. So there's a lot of beauty in these traits. There's nothing wrong with them. The problems come when we have no flexibility in how we can handle other people seeing us. Because then we've got, we feel like we always have to demonstrate to the outside world that we are these things. And we are those things, but we're also their opposite. And we have to get comfortable with that. And that's uh, easier said than done, but it's a really rewarding road to go down when you feel like that never-ending to-do list is, <laughs> is the bane of your life and drives you crazy. Was that ever you? Where would you say you fall on the spectrum? <laughs> it's not me now, but I couldn't have written the book if it wasn't once me. I, it wasn't. It wasn't just my patient observations. It was. It was uh, my own experience as well. So I was, it was. I was setting you up for that question. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> People was, um, are always like, "Oh my goodness! Like you look. Your life looks perfect." And then you just giggle and laugh, and you're like, P- um, "We write these books because we needed them, right? It's a healing <laughs> process." Exactly. And you, can't, and you can't have the insights if you don't go through it. And that's why something I think that can, that feels like a really big challenge at the time can sometimes become just such an extraordinary gift and you're grateful for it down the track. Mm-hmm. And what have you noticed since writing, like this is nine years old. So what, um, and that's how I came to you, the rushing women syndrome. But since then you've gone on to write more books and, um, can you talk a little bit about that? Like how your work has developed over the years and also um, what you're really passionate about talking now about, because mm. I know it shifts as we, as we grow. Yeah, it does. So 
I so I have I've, I've written thirteen books uh, so far, and I love writing. It's a privilege uh, to to be able to sit and write a book. I think, and uh, so my most recent book that I released last year was called The Invisible Load, and the idea of that was to really help women get to the heart of stress and see what it really is for them. So in Rushing Woman Syndrome, I talked about, I talked a lot to the physical consequences of always living with what's called sympathetic nervous system activation. So always living in that fight or flight response. And then since then, I, it's, I guess I always want to get to the heart of everything. So I just keep, you know, like, like we all try to do in our lives is just peel off layer after layer after layer to see what's really there and what's really driving that. So the invisible load was very much about getting to the heart of stress for an individual so that they could actually see what it is uh, for themselves because, and please know when I use the word stress, I'm not talking about trauma. And I also think it's very important to acknowledge, you know, that there's horrific stress going on in the world right now and, and in people's lives. There's very real stress occurring, but there's also a huge amount of stress we create for ourselves because of how we think. And that's the part we can change. So that's the part I'm interested in. So a lot of my work at the moment talks to that, to that stress we can change because the, the stress response uh, essentially begins in the middle of our brain in the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus uh, is a region in the brain and it's forever asking the question am i safe so it looks to your external environment so it's looking for threats if there's danger it's also assessing the temperature the availability of food oxygen so it's the hypothalamus is forever looking outside you saying am i safe but it's also looking inside you for information and so historically the only time we made adrenaline, epinephrine, the only time we would make that historically was when our life was literally in danger. And so science suggests humans have been on the planet for about 300,000 years. And up until the very, 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 very tiny, tiny little recent past, that's what adrenaline has meant to our body. But now in modern times, we will have elevated levels of adrenaline in our blood because of caffeine consumption. So the, the biological action of caffeine is that it leads the human body to make adrenaline, which puts us into that fight or flight response. So the regular overconsumption of caffeine is, has also been a really big shift over the last 30 odd years in the way that in our lifestyle choices. So caffeine leads to adrenaline production. The other things that tend to lead to adrenaline production these days are our perceptions of pressure and urgency. And we forget that they're perceptions. We forget that we get to choose how we see each day. And we, a lot of women, when you say, tell me, what, tell me about today, and they'll say, I have to do this, I have to do this, and it's all I have to. And a little flip you can try and do sometimes is I get to. So I get to pack these school lunches because my children have the privilege of going to school and getting an education. I get to vacuum the floor because I have a house, I have a home and I'm fortunate. So you can flip anything to, to see that you get to do it and that reconnects us even just momentarily to the privilege. Mm -hmm. The other things that will lead to adrenaline production these days, I think is what I spoke about a moment ago with our forward words. So we worry, we essentially worry about what other people think of us and that's not always visible. That's not always conscious. And we so that's been so digging into that is something that I'm really passionate about at the moment and helping people see where does that all of that adrenaline for you come from and because our body responds to the information we give it and it's such an important point for people to 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 grasp <clears throat> our body has not yet learned to decipher the difference between the adrenaline we produced when uh, when a car drives out in front of us and we've got to suddenly slam on our brakes the body doesn't see that adrenaline as any different from us worrying about our to-do list. It's all the same. So we have to find ways in our life to communicate to our body that we're safe because while ever the hypothalamus is saying, assessing that we're not safe because of all of that circulating adrenaline, the hypothalamus then says to the pituitary in our brain, and I call her the mother gland. She's the mother gland because she's the one looking after and communicating with all the other glands in the endocrine system, in our hormonal system. So when the hypothalamus says to the pituitary, hey, honey, we're not safe, you need to do your work, the pituitary then says to the thyroid, to the adrenals, to the ovaries, we're not safe, you need to respond with the signals I'm now giving you. So that has a huge impact 
on women's health, that constant, re- the, the instruction from the pituitary to the adrenals to constantly churn out stress hormones, the information that the pituitary sends to the ovaries saying we're not safe. So when we're not safe, we're less likely to ovulate. And when we don't ovulate, we don't spike our progesterone and progesterone is not just needed to hold the lining of the uterus in place. It's also a very powerful anti-anxiety agent and it's a diuretic. So it allows us to get rid of excess fluid. So a really big, a really common scenario I see for women is they are estrogen dominant. So they have too much estrogen compared to progesterone in the second half of their cycle. And then they have a lot of challenges then not just with their reproductive system, but also with a lot of anxious feelings, with fluid retention, with bowel, gut problems. So that's happening then because of all the adrenaline, they don't sleep properly. So they're not getting all the critical repair work going on and the restoration and the energy from their sleep. Then they've got the pituitary saying to the thyroid, we're not safe. And what happens with that is the, because adrenaline speeds everything up, thyroid hormones also speed everything up. So I think the body gets a lot of messages to to slow down. We get a lot of encouragement from our body to slow down and often it's our beliefs. I have to be a hard worker. I have to be all things to all people. I can't let anyone down. They all, all, that all drives the behaviour that overrides us, not listening to our body, telling us you need to slow down. And so then when the, thi- when the pituitary says to the thyroid, look, this, your, this person is making so much adrenaline, everything is so sped up, if I let you, the thyroid, make your hormones, you're going to speed everything up even more and we can't do- this person will explode if we do that. So the pituitary then says to the thyroid, slow down thyroid hormone production. So you can hear in how I've described that. There's nothing wrong with the thyroid, but you will then get symptoms that your thyroid's not working properly. So that's why it can feel so overwhelming when you feel like there's something going on with your sex hormones, with your thyroid, you know, your adrenals are switched on all the time. It's all coming back to that pituitary telling them all to do that. So where my work has has really gone is into that area of how do we let the pituitary essentially not have to tell the adrenals to constantly turn out, turn out, to churn out stress hormones? How do we communicate to our body that we're safe? when so much that we do and think now tells our body that we're unsafe. And that's where so many of our health challenges come from. This is amazing. And it's typically not until you've had a health challenge (laughs) until you begin to educate yourself on this. And Heather, that, that breaks my heart because, and it's very true, and I don't want it to be that way because we get, a, I think we, our body is so extraordinary. It really does try to wake us up before yeah. something much bigger happens, but we don't listen. And uh, I think a big part of your work, certainly a big part of my work is helping it not to take the crisis to get women to mm-hmm. shift in the way they look after themselves. It feels like a courageous act to say, I don't want to feel like shit anymore. Like to, to be like, I'm no, I don't want to be chronically exhausted. And one thing that came up while you were talking and just thinking about the past few months, um, obviously with many things going on in the world is I'm so tired and I haven't done anything. Like I, I found myself beating myself up a little bit, you know, now that I'm coming out of it and going oh, all the things I could have done. And then I'd say, Heather, that wasn't what was supposed to happen. You were supposed to go within and do your thing. You didn't have to be everything to everyone and whatever that may be, it's okay. Everyone has their own process Um, and we're all reacting differently. But I was hearing people say, I'm just so tired. I'm just so tired. I'm just so tired, but I'm, you know, doing less or I was laid off or, you know, I'm working and the kid thing and I have to homeschool and I have to do all this. I'm like, do you have to? Do you have to do it all or can you just understand that this, these are very unique times and do what you need to do, but you don't need to do it all? And it's really true. I've heard that story as well. I know some people were actually able to slow down a little bit, but a lot of people sped up 
and there was more on their plate than ever before. So yeah, it's it's but it has been a highly highly unusual, obviously unprecedented times, hasn't it? Yeah, it's it's just interesting. I feel like sentence a lot of I've heard from people say, okay, I finally have my wake up call, and there is, like I said, this courageous act. Maybe we can go back to that. The courageous act of saying, I deserve to feel good. Now where I'm at in my life, I'm like, no, I want to revolutionize what motherhood and what womanhood is for people. You can feel good. Actually, it's your birthright to feel good. And you're going to have a lot of unlearning to do and hormone rebalancing to do and re-education. But you can remember that your state of being you are allowed to feel good. And um, that is a very counterintuitive idea and belief for a lot of people. But And yet one that is just so important. And I think sometimes what stops us going there is we feel like our life is already so full and overflowing when on earth are we going to find the time to do things that are important to us or cook, make more home-cooked meals uh, that will help support our health better or... I think time, the perception that there's not enough time is a big uh, block to um, some women taking steps in that direction. And a, a way, to, I think, to start to examine that is when, when you feel like there aren't enough hours in the day, we essential, or when we say we don't have time for something, when you dig into that, I think what's really there is what we're saying, that that's just not a priority for me right now. And it's uncomfortable at first when you look at it that way. So, for example, if I'm in support, someone might come to one of my women's health weekends or I have a nine-week online course for women and, you know, a common statement will be, oh, I don't feel like I have time for that. So one of the ways that I'll support them through that is to say, okay, if, if it's true that we make time for what we prioritise, do you need to look at what your priorities are? Do you need to to sit down and check in with yourself and ask yourself, what do I value? What's important to me? Because if you haven't been encouraged to do that before, you've probably never done it. And a life, living a life aligned with our values, with what our soul uh, is, is crying out for us to do, to be ourselves is one of the most, it's a privileged journey to do, but it's a, such a vital one for us to have great health. So when we say we don't have time to cook dinner or if we say we don't have time to exercise, you've got to examine if you're comfortable with that. You've got to look, are you happy with that not being a priority uh, Mm. for you? So when we feel like it's this courageous act to feel better, sometimes one of the ways to to help that be easier or or simpler is to look at our priorities and uh, where we spend our time. I love that. I think it's a loaded question, you know, when we're I'm uncovering our truth and saying, oh crap, I haven't been making myself a priority. This is going to be a lot of work. Where do I start? And it's like, you're opening that can of worms. And I absolutely love the practicality of your work. Um, and this whole conversation, and it has just been so enriching (laughs) to me and obviously anyone who's listening to say I'm on the right path keep going keep going keep going because I truly believe the more we speak our truth the more we take a stand for the message we want to put out into the world of you know just not this maybe you don't know what your message is but when you have that little ache or inkling that I don't want this to be this way I would love to have a conversation with you because lately I've been feeling um well, I, not lately. I think previously I used to be like, who am I, right? Who am I? It's not really going to make a difference if I change my life. It's not really going to make a difference if I put myself out there. Um, and now, like you've, you know, you've mentioned a few times, it's a privilege to write a book. It's a privilege to be able to do this. How do you think having more women, I'm going to say empowered, but more more women feeling alive and energized and like feeling good in their body. How is that going to change the world? I feel my sense is that you then get to share your gifts with the world, whatever that is. So your gift might be your authenticity. Your gift might be a podcast, a book, what, uh, raising children who are able to handle the world that they're growing up in, children, you know, resilient, resilient children. So our gifts obviously are, you know, can, uh, can be anything. 
And sometimes it's just being who we are, like that's the biggest gift ever. Uh, so to, to, to be in touch with that and to allow that to be expressed, when we don't feel energised, when we are worried about our body shape and size, when we're in agony every month with our periods, for example, we're often not in a place where we can access that sense of contribution not all that's not not always true so of course sometimes we can but when we're suffering ourselves it can be very difficult to uh to contribute in the way that we want to and contributing that sense of contribution is such a win-win because obviously people who receive things benefit and then we feel really good when when we've given and when we've been able to contribute so to answer your question i think it allows us when we it allows us to share our gifts with the world whatever that looks like i love that and that mother Teresa quote I have no idea what it is, but something about it all starts at home. You know which one I'm talking about? Yeah, and it, it does, and it, and it requires us also to trust. I've been asked many times, and I think there's a feeling out there that people think the opposite of stress is calm. Mm. I would argue that it's not. I think the opposite of stress is trust, and we've forgotten to trust, and we've forgotten Ooh. to trust the unfolding of life and that because we, we, when you hear people speak, they'll say, oh, this happened to me, and they use the word to me, and I will challenge people and say, what if it's all for you? Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, hard, that's tricky because that, what if it's all for you, even the really tough stuff? What if it's, it's, it doesn't take away that it's painful? Because we live in extremes. We either think that things are painful and full of suffering or amazing, but usually they're both. And we, but we, we polarise things and we don't see that they're both. And so if we can change the belief that life happens to us to life happens for us, it can change that, our ability to trust the unfolding of it all. So it doesn't mean that it's not uncomfortable. It doesn't mean that it's not chaotic at times, overwhelming at times, incredibly sad and devastatingly heartbreaking at times. It doesn't mean it's not those things because it is all those things. Mm-hmm. But it also means that there's absolute magnificence and beauty there for us that will foster essentially our soul's growth. That's, that's my opinion and what, mm-hmm. I, what I choose to believe myself, but it can really help us, uh, uh, yeah, the, it can really help us to trust, I think, the unfolding of things. Yeah, and having that belief is a lot softer and kinder. And I've, I actually had a... Um, a friend, you know, she's been posting a lot about, she's a black woman and she's been posting a lot about what's going on right now. And I really resonate uh, with her because she, she's really big into yoga and meditation. And she's like, this is, you know, if we're going to do this in a sustainable way, we need to rest and restore. And she's like, my revolution is to, to, to choose joy. And just you know, when we're going through hard things, when we're experiencing pain, when we are, uh, when I say we, clearly I'm, I'm not a black woman, so I'm not, agen- I'm not saying I identify as that. Uh, what I mean is we can choose joy. And the suffering, like you said, can happen. We can look at it differently. We can have a different perception. Um, I'm just so grateful for this conversation, Dr. Libby, your work and your continued commitment to pulling back the layers around um, what this means. I think it's, you know, it's, it's interesting because it's just these little revolutions that we can make to say, you can choose, you can choose again, you can choose something different. Um, so where can people find you? I know people are going to say, but how, where do I start? And I'm sure you have a lot of resources that you can share with people. Obviously your books, um, your website, where do you hang out and what you said you had a coaching program and, um, some retreats that probably aren't happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Heather. Yeah. My website is drlibby.com. So just dr libby.com. And uh, yeah, you'll find all my offerings there. So I run a nine week online course for women four times a year. Uh, And uh, my team and I support women there with all their questions in a forum. There's a huge amount of education uh, in that course. I also do a little one hour online live events. So uh, webinars essentially uh, at the moment and then 
you can do those live with me where you can ask me questions uh, or you can buy them afterwards as a, as a recording. So you, there's uh, a couple on my website there at the moment about the thyroid. There's one about metabolism and one about perimenopause. Uh, so, yeah, just try to speak to when people, you know, share with me the things that are, that they don't understand, that they want to understand more. I tend to do those little online events just about those. So, uh, yeah, and then my books. Yeah, there are 13 books and, yeah, you can read about those on the website uh, as well. So I'm very, very grateful to have spoken to you today. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. And we will have all those links in the show notes. And I just appreciate this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.